Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, tell, turn around and tell somebody, <clears throat> even if you've already greeted everybody this morning, tell them they look good. Even if they don't. This is called walking by faith and not by sight. Hallelujah. You looking good in Jesus' name. Got my faith out there, baby. All right, let's go ahead and share out the Facebook uh, stream to everybody. Praise God. We're glad to have you this morning. And uh, we'll go ahead and receive our offering at the end of the service. Uh, if any of the kids come in, they can go ahead to the Children's Church. Uh, as they're coming in, they can just send them right on over there. Miss Janie's awaiting. All right. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles, if you will. Um, back to uh, the 37th Psalm, as we were uh, sharing last week, we began talking about um, our dreams, our vision, our destiny, and we want to um, be able to continue with that. We didn't really go far as to what I was going to do, but the 37th Psalm says, delight, in verse 4, says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So last week, we kind of majored on uh, setting the table for all this, that if we, we need to spend time with God, we need to get our desires from God, okay? Not necessarily going to God to get what we desire, but go to God to get the desire that he will give us. Now, that, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying, you know, um, a lot of people go to the Lord and say, Lord, bless this mess, Okay? In other words, you got a plan, you want the Lord to bless it. It's just a whole lot easier to go ahead and get the plan from Him. It's already blessed. Okay? You get it from the Lord, it's already got the anointing on it. It's already got it. But let's go, um, <coughs> and, and a couple of scriptures we could give you along this line. John 16, 16, Jesus said, you've not chosen me. I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whosoever whatsoever you shall ask of the father in my name he may give it you early in that same chapter in verse 7 he said if you abide in me and my words abide in you you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you and then first john 5 14 and 15 john writing to the church and says this this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions we desire of him. So here we go. If we ask anything according to his will. We know he hears us. Now, this is the problem. You've got a lot of people spending a lot of time trying to get God to bless their mess, to bless whatever they come up with, to bless um, some idea that they had, some fleeting fancy that they had. Amen. Okay? They're, they're, they're operating in a way to try to get God to do something instead of going ahead and getting with God and he had what he wants in the first place. Amen. It's so much better to find out what God wants in the first place than you don't have to struggle with, is it his will? Does he want it to happen? Amen. Uh, not nearly as much anyway. Now, Abraham, let's look, look at the life of Abraham for a minute. The Lord said, get thee out of thy country, out of thy kindred, out of thy father's house, and go into a place that I will show thee. And I'll bless thee and multiply thee, and make thee exceeding abundant, and so forth. And so forth. I made thy seed as a sand of the seashore. That's when it's 75. That didn't come to pass until he was done. He had a couple of hiccups along the way. Okay? Had one major hiccup. Major hiccup. Hagar in the tent. All right? You know? And even at that, um, before... Uh, before he got there, he, he went, to, went to the Lord and said, oh, that, you know, that um, um, Stuart in his house, Eleazar, he wanted to let that, that kid live before him. 
And the Lord said, well, no, it's going to come out of your loins. You know, Sarah got stressed somewhere out there, and, you know, and Hagar, him and Hagar went and had, had them a little, you know, couch time. Yeah? Because they're going to help bring the Lord's plan to pass. Now, you understand that the concubine to the, the, um, or the uh, maid servant, a uh, maid to the, the wife, she them, you know, there's like property, you know. And so she okayed it. He didn't argue. And let me say this. Let me say this. When you have a word or a plan or a dream or an inspiration from God, there's always going to be somewhere in there that somebody comes up with a way to make it happen that's not God. It's not the plan of God. Hello. God did not recognize that as his plan. He recognized it as an alternative. Okay? And so, uh, and let, that brings us to this. Let's go to Habakkuk, the second chapter. Because we, you know, as Christians, we know we, we walk by faith and not by sight. And I, I, I believe sometimes we have failed to really understand how and when faith works the way it does. There are certain things, your faith in Jesus Christ, accept him as Lord, that's instant. Healing can be progressive. Financial is long term. Now, we got people running, you know, and we all did this. I did it. We all kind of were running, kind of calling that narrative supernatural debt cancellation because we're going to have suddenly. Have you ever read the book of um, Malachi? You know, hallelujah. That's the last book of the Old Testament. That was 1,500 years before John the Baptist. Okay? 1,500 years plus before the day of Pentecost. We know from Old Testament Scripture we were promised that there would be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yet in the book of Acts it says, on the day of Pentecost was fully come, there came a, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty wind. And we jump on that suddenly, and we start thinking of, of things in microcosms of time when the word that was given was over 1,500 years prior to that event. But when it showed up, it was all of a sudden. And you see, we get, we get into prosperity. I think they're going to go give a one offering to one preacher, and then overnight they're going to have a sudden debt, supernatural cancellation out of the blue. The laws of prosperity, you have to work continuously. And then when it happens, it's like, whoa, suddenly. But see, we keep, we keep looking at terms, and I think that when we don't really delineate this properly, you get people who get frustrated and start trying to interject a man plan for why it didn't happen. You know, and let's, come on, guys. Now, let me, I'm going to be real honest with you. I love, I love, I love our preachers. But sometimes they'll do stuff and you just kind of shake your head. You know, you got to give up to the higher anointing. You got people running around trying to give enough money to the enough preachers that they're going to get debt free next week. There's law, there are laws, biblical laws of finance. One is you tithe to the local church and give offerings. You give special offerings as your heart desires, as the Lord prompts you, but not because somebody said, if you give to me in this offering, you're going to have, you're not going to be, you're going to be debt free next week. Now, number one, there's no basis for faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Hello. Well, how can it be sin if you're if it's because of pride or because of lust for other, for the things of this world, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches? Hello. And you're giving for the wrong reason. You have not because you ask not, or you or you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. There's a lot of people throwing money in preachers' pockets, trying to stuff it in there because they think they're going to get a, 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 a Beamer or Mercedes-Benz or a Bentley next week. And it 
thwarts them from God's plan. Do I believe in biblical prosperity? Absolutely, 100% guaranteed. I believe that as I tithe and give offerings and I obey God's laws of prosperity, and I do what the Lord tells me to do, that, he, that I'm blessed, that I walk in abundance, that I walk in overflow. Amen? Now, last year, this time, moving into, um, uh, even into the more the, of last year, of 2017, we were pretty much in a, I mean, we were almost toast financially. I mean, it was bad. Church had contracted, less money in there. I mean, we were just, I mean, we were in trouble. Hello? And then, the Jeep blew up, blew the engine in the Jeep. The white car we had was running on like a three-legged dog. Hello? And we needed to go get another car. And we, people wouldn't loan us money. Somebody finally did. And then the kids got a new car. None of us could have one at the time. All of a sudden, it was a new car. And the Lord spoke to me at that time. See, here's what happens. When the Lord speaks to you, what? Not, not, not just a, you know, I'm going to confess that I've got this and that. I had a need. And the Lord got it for us. Hello. Just refinanced at a lower interest rate, by the way. Just, you know, we didn't get the great interest rate because of some stuff. But now the stuff's been cleared up and things are in better shape. We went and got it refinanced at a lower interest rate. And they're going to pay it off sooner than it was supposed to, you know. And um, got gap insurance, too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Lord. We can tell you, you need gap insurance. You know. Yeah. What gap insurance? It's what yeah, it covers what the insurance company says your car is worth and what you actually owe on it. They, they say your car is worth, you know, 6000 but you owe ten. And you're responsible for the other four if you're not covered. You know. So anyway, the Lord spoke to me. I was riding, riding in the car thinking, Lord, you had to do this. We, we couldn't do this. We needed. He said, this is just the beginning of the turnaround. Well, then, we, we had tried three times to refinance our house to clear some things. They wouldn't do it. They said, well, you know, because you got this, ex we won't, we won't do it. I'm thinking, I'll make, I'll have more money left over each month if you'll do that. I'll be paying it. I'll just get more money coming in, not going out, paying it off, paying it off quicker, paying it off better, uh, paying less interest on it, actually paying more money to, to the debt if you'll do this. Not, we can't do it. You're outside of our numbers. Finally, uh, you know, the same police credit did. It it totally, totally freed up so much money that you know now we're we're not sitting around freaking out. You know, hey, Lord, Lord, help us. You know, we have an answer. We got to get out of this. You know, you, you, you look at that sometimes. You're going and and then you look back. And you go, how did we make it? How, how did we make it? We'll see. That's right, but God. But see, we are tithers and givers our whole life. And even in the midst of the battle, we were making it and couldn't figure out how we were making it. I mean, we look at what we were, was coming in, what was going out, and how were we not how were we not not going under? I mean, I, my nose was the water. That was it? Sometimes I think I had to put a straw in there to. You know, you know, but now it's all it's, uh, that's turning around. I mean, that that situation is just like wow. You know, I don't even know how we made through this past summer. Janie doesn't get paid during the summer. She's not. She's a ten months. She didn't get paid June and July, or July and August, or whatever it is. How are we go? How, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hubba 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 hubba. Yeah, you feel me? All right. But the Lord said, now here we have, we've been faithful. Now we have a word from the Lord on that we just weren't trying to dream up, that weren't we debt-free in the end of the summer and all that. I'm not making things statements. Well, you can have what you say. Let's, let's, now let's go right here. Habakkuk 1, 2, 1. 
I will stand upon my watch. I will stand upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. And I, will, and I, I shall answer when I am reproved. The word reproved here in the Hebrew also means corrected. Do you understand that even when you're walking by faith and you're living your life, even when God's given you a direction or a word or a vision, uh, put things in heart, that there are going to be course adjustments and corrections? You up here? You're going to have to have course corrections and adjustments. Meaning what? Meaning God, when you, you've got to spend time with the Lord. You just can't keep barreling ahead and not spending time hearing what he has to say. Full steam ahead. Well, there are places for that, that bull doggedness, but you've got to spend time with the Lord still. You've got to get course correction. Because you can sway off course. You can, start, you can, you can buy into a narrative that's, that's really setting you off course instead of putting you on course. Hello? You can somebody preach something. And in the context of what they preach to the time they preach, it may have a certain meaning taken out of that setting or whatever. <coughs> That's why I'm not a big advocate that every time somebody has a great sermon, you need to go write a book out of it. Hello? Not everything. There are things preached. There could be things preached that in that room, in that room, in that atmosphere with the people present, with what's going in their life that word was specific for them that taking out of that setting and taking somewhere else is going to take on different meaning and because of that people try to run off with now um let me let me give you an example uh, about 20 years ago 25 years ago one of the biggest things in the church was warring tongues in the in the charismaniac church and i listen i'm gonna be i, I have been at the forefront of the charismaniacs not charismatic, but care, care crazies. I was a care crazy at one time. You know, Raymond got me straightened up, but it took some time because I was a nutbag. Hello? And he walked up to me and said, good luck. I said, I don't believe in luck. Luck's a root word for Lucifer. I'm blessed. Yeah, that just went over real good, didn't it? You really helped me gender them to the things of God, buddy. You know? Uh, and, and confession beepers, I manufactured them. And gave them to other people. I mean, I was a care of nutbag. You know, God, so, so when I look at some of these people, you know, you kind of go, well, there's hope. I'm living proof. Okay? But um, back the time there, we got in this thing, they got in this thing called warring tongues. You know? And they'd have meetings. And they all sit there and scream at the devil in tongues until they were hoarse. Yeah, me, I mean, just, just stand there for hours and the place. Now, do I believe there's ever been a time that people inspired by the Holy Ghost, by the unction of the Spirit, have prayed in the Spirit against the enemy? You can't teach it. You can't teach people to do it. There's no basis for faith for it. There's no basis of Scripture to do it. So it has to be something that you were led of the Spirit to operate in. A by the Holy Ghost. That's right. You can't make a doctrine or a teaching or a practice out of it. It's not something that you can get a bunch of people together. We're going to fight the devil and we're all going to scream at him in tongues. An unction of the Holy Ghost for something like that. That's what, that's what I'm saying. And that and it may be in a certain setting when God inspired something at some, maybe one time. That took place. But see, people take that and run out and they're going to try to teach it. Can't do it. Yeah, I said you can't do it. And so we might hear a message and God might tell people to do something. That, do I believe there's been times that God inspired people to go up and put money, give the preacher money or the, you know, uh, Yes. But I've seen it, I've been at meetings before where every service, every time they were out there, everybody got up and walked down and put money in the preacher's pockets. To the point one of them started wearing a, a windsuit jacket that had a, a, an elastic bottom that cut, so it wouldn't fall out. 
and the teaching that, you know, you're going to be blessed because you did it. I don't have any basis of faith for doing it that way. Hello? But do we, we don't muzzle the oxen that tread out the corn. The labor of the other is hired. But I watched, and I, I experienced, I personally experienced being in a meeting like that and only getting up and going up and putting money because I felt the pressure of looking unspiritual in the eyes of all those around me because they were all doing it. What's this got to do with vision? Just hang with me. All right? And I remember sitting there after doing that, and I heard these words. That's the reward. What? That's the reward. What? The pressure's off. You gave to get the pressure off. There's your reward. It wasn't faith. Y'all hear you gone home. I said there was no faith involved. It was simply the pressure of getting, it was simply the, to get the pressure off that you looked unspiritual. So you got your reward. You no longer look unspiritual. Now, do I believe that giving to ministries it will cause you to be blessed? Absolutely. Now, you can purpose in your heart to give. But don't purpose in your heart to give because somebody told you that if you give to me, you're going to be debt-free next week. Now, that's, let's get back to back. That's why I'm trying to show you something here. He says, I will stand upon the tower. I will, set, uh, I will watch to see what he will say unto me. In other words, what do we talk about last? Delight thyself in the Lord. Amen. He shall give thee the desires of thy heart. What? Delighting yourself. Set yourself on the tower. And, and I, and, and, and I, and, and see here. And what he was saying to me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. I, I hate classes, guys. I'm sorry. I take them on and off all the time. The word reproved is going to be corrected. Of course, adjustment. I believe that when we've delighted ourselves from the Lord, he puts things in your heart. He puts desires in your heart. He puts things in your heart that, he, you know, you know um, that you desire to see come to pass because he put them there. Just like God told Abraham, he's going to take him into a land that he was showing. Abraham had that desire in his heart. He took off. He didn't quite obey. He took Lot. He wasn't supposed to take Lot. Lot caused him some problems. Hello? He wants to get out of that father's house from that kindred and go into a place that he was supposed to take his wife and, and take off. Not the nephew. Nephew wasn't supposed to go. And nephew's wife was a lot of trouble. She's quite salty, you know. Hallelujah. And so, you know, when we when we Set ourselves. And see, this is something we need to be doing all the time. Why? Because you're going to need course directions. Because, let's go ahead and read this. I, I'm, going to get, I'm going to need to be corrected. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall, not, it shall speak, not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, I feel like sometimes when you read that verse, you get, you get double talk. You're going, he said it's not going to tarry, but if it tarries, wait for it, because it's not going to tarry. Um, what is it? Is it going to tarry or not tarry? Well, let's, you know, here's the problem. Uh, they use an English word to interpret or translate two different Hebrew words. Okay? Um, he says the vision is for an important time. That phrase, for an important time, Kind of says this, has an appointment. That, that vision has an appointment. God gave you something that's going to come to pass. I hadn't seen it yet. That's where that Terry thing comes in. See, we, we burn when God first speaks to something to us. 
I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, God gives you something about your life. You know, uh, I know Brother Bill in ministry and myself in ministry and Jess been to Bible school and, and the kids have been to Bible school and things are in their heart. And you can, you can, and Benny preaches and, and so forth. And God can put things in your heart that just burn. And then life. Come on now. Life. Stuff going on. Are you here? Stuff is going on that seems just to kind of sidetrack everything. Y'all here, you're going home. I had some kids. You got a job. Physically, things happened. You know? Uh, I, I know ministries and ministers where, where they, they ended up divorced because their, their spouse flaked out on them. You know? And, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't any good anymore because, you know, they, you know they, just got, they, they got life happened. Folks, life's going to happen. Things are going to come your way. The enemy will come again. I'm, I'm a, you're not a word of faith. Oh, yeah, I'm a word of faith preacher. Because fight the good fight of faith. Amen? I'm telling you, Paul wrote and took a whole chapter to talk about life. Perils in the city and perils in the country and perils in my own countrymen. Three, uh, uh, what, three times saved, received out 39 stripes, 40 stripes, saved one. Set down over the wall, stoned and left dead. You know, in shipwrecks often, in fasting often, in nakedness often. No, 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 no. He goes on and on and on and on. What's he saying? Life happens. But then Paul writes later and says, I've kept the faith. Amen? He went through. He said, I, fi I, I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there was laid up for me a crown. Now, wait a second now. So he, he wrote to the church of Corinth. He took a whole chapter to talk about life. The poo-poo of life. Okay, let's get biblical. The dung of life. Bad stuff coming at you. Testings and trials coming at you. Tribulations coming at you. Like Brother Hagin said, some folks think, you know, sink or swim, live or die, go over, go under, and sometimes you do all of them. Hello? Life's throwing everything at you, including the kitchen sink and the dirty water in it. But that does not mean that you lack faith. I'm going to be honest with you. If you've never had a test or a trial and never had to go through anything, you don't know anything about living by faith. You're usually some whippersnapper that thinks you've got everything put together, got your business cards, got your, your, your audios on with us, and da 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 You've been married six months, and you're teaching marriage seminars. I know a lot about me. Look, anybody can go read a book and spew out what's in the book. Hello? It's like the guy who wrote all this stuff on basic youth conflicts. You know, you know everything that people dealt with was a basic youth conflict. He was 40 years old, single, never been married, lived with his mama. And he's going to teach everybody in the church you know, how to deal with their youth, your youthful lust and problems that they're still having trouble with. I'm sorry. Hello? You know, Dad Hager, you go back and listen to him. He says this. He said, the Lord told me, he said, he said, you've learned the lifestyle you've lived by faith through the word and through experience. He had to live through it. He had to win it. I had a, I was at a um, not this past September, but the September before. We were at our um, our um, regional retreat. Rain for our this region for Rama, and Brother Doug Jones was ministering. And he said something that was just stark. And he sat in that room and said, Guys, look at us. He said, It's time for you to tell your stories. He said, You're telling bad stories. It's time for you to tell your stories. It's time for you to have lived through some things, overcome, experienced the victory, 
by doing what the Word says, and they'll stand and tell your stories. Amen. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly right. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm living a story right now. I went to my doctor on Thursday. And yeah, I'm still in the boot, but my, you know, it's just, it's just better for me to be in this. I could put on a shoe, but it's just not. I don't need for it to be um, hot and sweaty in there, you know. Uh, so I'm in this recovery boot. But uh, now, this two a month ago, the measurements of the op- the, the wound on the top two point it was four point eight cubic centimeters, not cubic uh, square centimeters. Two weeks later, it was two point four square centimeters. This week is one point two. It's closing up. All right. After he got done, we talked, and he's you know, he break. They, they, they cut off any tissue that's not healthy. Not necessarily, it's, it's, it's like infected or bad. It's just it hardens. That, the callus, you know, on the edges. So they cut that off. That it'll, it'll stimulate growth and that kind of thing. I said, Doc, let me ask you a question. Because I, I already know what the infectious disease doctor said, thought. He told me in the hospital what he thought. We're going to take that off in the morning. Even when he said we we're going to start on the antibiotics to give me a chance not for it to be cut off, he said, yeah, you just need to keep it back in your mind. They we're probably going to come back here and have to take it off. I don't receive that in Jesus' name. I'm keeping my toe. And so the, you know, the, the podiatrist that came and said, well, I think you know, we can give you a chance to see how this works. I said, now, honestly, what did you think? He said, looking at your toe, he said, my gut feeling was, you've got to understand, I see this all the time. He said, and most people, Lose their toe. He said, my gut feeling was you weren't going to be able to keep the toe. He said, but people aren't you. You keep proving the pun that's wrong. Well, that's I've, I've open. I told him, so look, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do in the natural. I've done everything I need to do dietary-wise to make my body so it's, it can heal. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do diligently, but I'm also believing God. And you guys are doing your job. I'm doing my, I know how to take care of that spiritual side. And I have been, listen, they're not even talking about the possibility of cutting anything off. Well, they had to cut, yeah, had to cut All right? There's no talk about it at all. Because you, can, you just keep proving the pundits wrong. You know? Now it's just a matter of, actually, he's going to see me in three weeks. Let's come back two weeks so you can debrief it some more so he just keeps, you know. Keeps going. We don't want to just delay it at all. We want to keep it going. You know, he's, he's thinking about money because you know, they're, they're specialists. They're more expensive than the standard doctor. But, you know, it's like we want to be done. I want to be off the antibiotics, which, you know, I want to be off the antibiotics. I'm tired of the chalk. The, the taste of back your mouth from the antibiotics is a chalky taste. But I didn't get thrush. See, a lot of people get thrush in their mouth from taking all these antibiotics long term. No thrush. Not going to have it either. That white, ultra look in your mouth and stuff. You know. But I am in bacteria free zone. Yeah, they just they just can't function on my body anywhere. Which is why when I didn't take a bath for all that time, I didn't have to have to be all about it because there was nothing growing that could smell. We were just bacteria free. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm 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 got a, I've got a story already, but I don't have a story now, like never before. Stories of the past financially, you see, and what God wants to do is He wants us to spend time with Him, get direction from Him, get those words from Him, line it with His word, and then stay in tune with Him, so He can correct us in the process if we need to. Hello, I said hello. Want? out what God put in your heart, then we need to, like, this is the beginning of a new year, in the calendar year. Start at, you want to walk into things God's promised you? Then spend time with Him so He can correct course because some of you have lost your vision or lost the drive for your vision for your own personal life. Not just, not just the things, of, not just um, um, church. And, you know, Satan, Satan attacks everywhere. He attacks you individually, attacks us corporately. Taxes to Christ, tries to get certain uh, 
parts of the body off where they can't do what they, you know, and then it, you know, things fall here and then uh, things don't catch up. It's a strategy. So let's look at this. The phrase for an appointed time um, kind of means this, has an appointment. Okay? Not, not so much so that there is a day and a date that it's going to happen no matter what. It's, it kind of carries more that it, there's an appointment. It's, it's a point. It's going to happen. This is, this is the plan for it to come to pass. Okay? Um, at the end, the word end is a little bit different. It, it, at the border, at the final, it actually says the process. At the end of the process. In other words, we keep looking for this final thing that's going to have to make it all happen. It's, it's, it's this process works. The appointment for this process to fulfill. Okay? And then um, it shall speak and not lie. Now, this is, this is the um, phrase that really set, helps give insight. It, it shall speak, it shall not lie. It won't be in vain. It won't be in vain. God is saying, that thing I put in your heart, that thing when you came to me and you were birthed in the things of God, and, and, and in their heart was something that was just there. A deposit by the Spirit of God. A vision, a dream, a destiny that we all got. You have it in there. There's things you began to dream about as a Christian. It was a ministry or it was, it was living a full life in the things of God and being a blessing in the earth. There were things in there. And God says that it's not going to be in vain. Am I still in the picture? Okay. It's not going to be in vain. Not, you see, it shall not lie. You know, and I know that kind of, you, know, you remember King James tries to use one word uh, interpretations. So to put not be in vain is a, lot, a little bit longer than saying it won't lie. So God says that the thing he placed in your heart that has an appointment to come to pass won't be in vain. In other words, what, what, is, what does the devil come and tell you? The same thing he told Job. That you have served God for naught. It's been in vain. All the things you've done for God have been in vain. Hello? Doesn't matter. It's not going to carry weight. It's not going to be fulfilled. It's not going to come to pass. Yet God says that the vision, the things I placed in your heart, and the end of this process, what's this process? Faith. Living out what he spoke to you. Hello? See, Brother Bill, the devil tried to nail him in the coffin. As a matter of fact, had the front loader loaded up with the dirt to put over the casket. Hello, just waiting for them to drive him over there and drop him in the ground. Yeah, he wanted to be using a hammer. He was using a nail gun. Hello. But you see, Lord's got, Brother Bill has a vision, has a dream, has a call. Ministry. And the Lord says, it's not in vain. The things He put there are not in vain. Hello. What God's called us into is not in vain. And He goes on and says, and though it... Let's, let's look here. Look here. So at the end, it will speak and not be in vain. I'm, I'm, I'm giving the interpretation out of the King, verses the King James. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now you look at Hey, he just said, if it tarries, wait, because it's not going to tarry. Two different words in the Hebrew. The first one means, kind of conveys this thought of being reluctant. It seems to be reluctant. Have you had... In your walk with God, the dream that's in your heart seem like it's just being reluctant to happen. It's just dragging its feet. Hello? Okay? So it, it's, it's not that. It is not that, you know, God said it might look this way. Abraham got there at about 87, 86. God had given him a word. I'm going to multiply these as the sand of the seashores and as the stars of the heavens. And all nations you'll be blessed. All nations will be blessed in you. 
Amen? I'll I'll multiply you and multiply you. Glory to God. Abraham takes off in about 86. Sarah comes to him and goes, look, I hadn't had a baby yet. You know, and and I'm, um, I'm 66. She's 10 years younger than me. All right, well, 86 or 76. She's 76. Look, over there, you see Hagar over there? Abraham's going, yeah, I've seen her before. Take her and, you know, maybe the God, you know, gives you the, you know, the seed through her. So Abraham and Hagar go in the tent, still paying the price. Hello? Still paying for that one-night stand. Hello? What have we got? We have got a deferred dream or a deferred word. Something that we think would happen by now has not happened. And so somebody comes up with a plan. It doesn't matter if it's a good plan, a man plan, a God plan, a God, you know, a, 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 a plan right out of hell. It's a plan. Got to do something. But God says that when it looks like it's not happening, wait. Hello? God says, wait. To delay anger. To be reluctant. So though it looks like it's being reluctant, though it looks like it's lingering, though it looks like it's delayed, Go back to what he said in verse 1. I will set me upon the tower. I will wait to see what he says. In the time and the season where it looks like it's not coming, you got to wait on the Lord. I didn't say don't do anything. I said wait on the Lord. There might be course corrections. Now, Abraham could have got his course correction before Hagar. He got it afterwards. appeared to him at 99 and said walk before me and be thou perfect for you know um you know i am the el shed i'm the almighty god and then and all that so goes oh the ishmael might live before thee and he said out of sarah will your seed come the seed will not be of a bond woman he got a course correction hello he could have gotten a course correction before Hagar. But wait. Stay faithful. Stay diligent. Don't give up. It's easy to quit when you don't see answers. Come on now. Like I said, there are certain things, you know, getting born again. You get born again right away. That's not, not a delay thing. Are you here? But there are other things that are, that are time. They're just the vision, the dream, the destiny. You're going to have to live that. You're going to have life in between. The word and the answer or the fulfillment. That's why you got to fight, fight the good fight of faith and keep winning and keep overcoming and keep waiting on the Lord so he can keep you on course. Hello? Because God placed something in you. He desires to see fulfilled. And he's going to work with you. <clears throat> and if you'll listen, he'll say, no, how many of you ever let somebody else drive a car <clears throat> on a trip? And you know where you're going, and they don't. In other words, we're going to Tulsa. They ain't never driven there before. I've driven so many times, I could just about, go, I could about tell you where the cracker balls are, what exit to sleep at, hello, how far it is across what state, hello, it's 457 miles across Tennessee on Interstate 40. It's about 290 across Arkansas on Interstate 40. And from the border of Interstate, from Arkansas to the Muskogee Turnpike is 30 miles or 35 miles. And then from there, it's about 50, 60 miles to Broken Air and 72 to up into Tulsa. All right? 
There's Casey Jones Railroad Station with all you can eat buffet at exit 8 in Tennessee. Yeah. The eastern half of Arkansas is not pretty. Unless you like rice patties. Uh, Western, no, those are pretty, pretty nice. Area. The far gets a little bit kind of not nice. After past the uh, power station. Just off on the left of Interstate 40. Yeah. After, that's after Little Rock near Conway. All right. So anyway, I mean, now we get in the car and, and you're driving and, and I'm over there. Going, um, now I got this. Well, if you get a little rock, take, take a left, uh, you're going to Dallas. Because Interstate 30 starts there. Hello. If you don't get off on the Muskogee Turnpike, you're going to end up not only in Oklahoma City, Barstow, California. Okay, any three days later, two days later. Okay, I mean, you just zip right on out. And, and, and of course, Interstate 40 ends at I-15 in Barstow, near the, the, near the Calico Ghost Town. Don't I? Been there. <laughs> no, we flew and came back. So you, what you, here's what you do. If you're riding with someone who knows how to go, you ask them a, ke- a question occasionally. If you've ever, ever gone through Nashville, I, hate, I don't go through Nashville on Interstate 40. I get off on the 440 and go south because 24 and um, what is it, 65, is this 25, 24, 75? That's 75. It's, 60, it's 24. And another interstate, I forget what it is right now, merge with 40 near downtown Nashville. And it's, it's coming in here. You're going, it's, it's worse than our death valley. And then they peel off to the right and the left. Get off and go 440 around and miss all that. Yeah. It's, it's worth, it's, it's about the same distance. It's just, see, if you get course corrections, you can get around that. And miss a whole bunch of stuff. Like what? Almost getting killed. I've almost been taken out several times where 24 and 40 merge because people get you get all the way over because it, it splits back off. You know, you're like, whoa, Nelly. So here we are. Course corrections. Somebody knows where they're going can give you a course correction save you a lot of trouble. When we spend time in the presence of God and we let God speak to us, he'll give you course directions on your way to your destiny. And get you where on the best route so that you don't mess up and don't miss it. Hello. And so, though the vision, though the dream that you've written down seems to linger, seems to be delayed, wait. What do we do when we're not seeing things move the direction we think they ought to? We go wait. Now, not just sit back and do nothing. Go wait on the Lord. Because he can simply pat you on the back and say, just stay steady. He can't pat you and say, now, you need to do this. But don't you go to some stupid seminar where somebody tells you, you know, you got to do this if you want your church to grow. I've had people tell me that you got to have a bus ministry. Sat in the room with a guy one time, well, well, well known. And, and a great man of God. But the particular church he pastored, they had a huge bus ministry. I don't know how many, I mean 70, 80 buses that went around and picked people up every Sunday. And um, somebody asked him in the, in the minister's meeting, there were about 15 of us in there, do you think everybody ought to have a bus ministry? He said, well, I'm not saying everybody ought to have a bus ministry, but I question your call to pastor if Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, well, I don't have one. And I'm sorry. I know God spoke to me and told me to do what I'm doing. 
No question. No, I want, listen, you've got to understand. When God called me to pastor, when I got, knew that I was a pastor, I was running from the word pastor. It was a cuss word. Nobody at that stage in the, in the time of the word of faith wanted to be a pastor. We were all called to be prophets and teachers. Prophets to the nations and teachers of the word of God. Every one of us came out of and have a traveling ministry. The glitz, the glory. I mean, we're going to have you know, our own prosperity ties and cars, and, and you know, we're going to have our prosperity suits, and we're just going to turn the world upside down because we're the greatest thing since peanut butter and sliced bread. Went out as the man of faith and power and found out I was nothing but paste and powder. Hello. Because without him, I'm nothing. Paul said, I am the least of all the saints. Without the anointing of God, without the calling of God, I can't do anything. You can market it. You can get the right tie. You can get the right suit. You can drive the right car. You can have the best looking product table on the planet. But if it's not anointed and called of God, it is nothing. So he told that. And so you got people going out and they're all going, oh, I need to get a bus. I need to get a bus. I'm thinking, I ain't getting a bus. I'm not going to go buy some 1964 piece of junk that the school system got right up, paint over the, the, the school system with black paint, and then write with a hand brush paint sign and say, Faith and Victor Church of Prosperity. Come on out. <laughs> Every time you see it, it's sitting on the side of the road with the hood up. Or when it pulls in the parking lot, you, know, you got to go out there and, and fill it up with oil and put in a gallon of gas. Because it's leaking everywhere. Are you here? You gone home? I mean, some rattle trap that, that, that you know that the highway patrol would condemn if it caught pulled you over. But I got a bus man. No, you don't. And if God didn't speak to you out there, you better not do it. That man had faith to do it. Because God called him to do. You can't emulate or copy him simply because. He said he questions your call if you don't have a bus ministry. Well, he's not the caller. You let other people tell you whether you're or not, you could get in trouble. Now, you know, listen, there's wisdom, there's counsel. I understand that. But I'm just telling you, statements like that don't determine whether you're called or not. Y'all hear you going home? Boy, got a lot of time here. I'm just warming up. I'm just warming up. So what do we do? What Something's in our heart. Something's burning on the inside. But what is it when it just doesn't look like it's happening? It's time to go back and talk down with the Lord. The one that gave it to you in the first place. Now, remember, when he's put that word into Abraham and said, get thee out of that country, away from that kindred, out of thy father's house, and go into a place, what? That I will show thee. What's that mean? Somewhere in this travel, he's going to have to have some course corrections. He's going to have to get more direction. He's going to bless him as the sand of the seashores, as the stars of the heaven. All nations will be blessed with you, Abram. Now go. Where am I going? I'll show you more later. Hello? And Abraham you know, was not bright sometimes. Hello? Tell me my sister. So here we go. Abram's out on this trail. And it's got to get course directions, corrections. He knows he's headed toward something. God puts a dream in your heart. You know you're headed toward something. Come on. But you have to wait and get corrections or, direct, or, or, or redirected, fine-tuned along the way. Why? Because it will surely, it will not tarry. It will, it, you know, though it looks like it's being delayed, it's not. It's not going to be delayed. But wait, 
because it will surely not tarry. It won't tarry. That last word, tarry, means to be in vain, that we said. It won't be in vain. The thing that you have believed God, God put in your heart as you get, we, need course, we all need course corrections. I said we all need course corrections. Nobody just goes out and does it perfect without course correction. Jesus was all night in prayer. Hello, the master, the head of the church, the second person of the Godhead. He was and is and is to come. Spent all night in prayer. What was he doing to get course corrections of ministry? Come on, church. So I know for some of it, including myself, we, we can count things. The church. Something got into our church one time because uh, people would come in and say, it's around the corner. Said, Let me say, when God says something's around the corner, his around the corner, his around the corner, usually aren't the same. Are you here, you're going home. We think, we think in the mindset of a microcosm, he thinks in the mindset of eternity. Somebody was on the platform one time, and they said, if one more person just says, it's right around the corner, I think I'm going to puke. And, of course, your first reaction is, well, I'm going to throw you off the platform. Shut up, because you don't need to say stuff like that. You know, they thought they'd be encouraged. They weren't being encouraged, and they're making people think, oh, it's really something really wrong here. You see, then people start questioning, why hadn't this happened yet? Why hadn't this going on yet? Even when Isaac was born, his seed was not as the sand of the seashores or the stars of the heaven. It was not innumerable. It was one. And at 13, God told him to offer as a sacrifice. But even then, it wasn't that way. And even that way, when Israel grew to in the numbers they grew into, it wasn't that way. It's been the church. We're the seed of Abraham. If you be Christ, then you're the seed of Abraham. And we're so many mil hundreds of millions of Christians, those who become the seed of Abraham. It, di it didn't even happen in his natural life. Not saying what God put in your heart is not going to happen in your natural life. I'm just saying we can't think in the terms of paycheck to paycheck or next week or this when we're thinking about dreams God put in our heart. We have to be eternity minded. Hello? Now, sometimes God gives specifics. This time next year. Well, when God gives specifics like that, glory to God. But you can't take some of His word and make it work for you. An example. And we've told this story before, but a guy down in Texas was, was an old guy. And the Lord spoke said, I want you to go drill here, but I want you to have your guys drill it at a 45-degree angle. So he goes out to the, you know, the foreman, he says, hey, pulls out the geological, says, I need for you to drill here. And the guy says, there's a hole there. He said, I want you to drill here. He said, we're, we're just going to waste time because there's nothing there. The geological showed nothing there. He said, I'm the boss. I'm paid. You drill there. And pull it at a 45-degree angle. It's your goal. Boss comes back out. I want you to go here. Guy says, there's no oil there. He said, I'm the boss. Argues with him. I mean, even after, he probably thought, he just got lucky. And after about the third or fourth time of that, he just came to the guy and put the geologist up and said, what well, do you want to drill next? <laughs> now, the guy gave a testimony in church. Another oil guy was in there. Took a scripture. The Lord's not a respected person. He did it for him or do it for me. Started going out and telling people to drill places and went bankrupt. Why? Because the Lord didn't tell him to do it that way. Now, the Lord's promised prosperity, but he didn't tell you how. He needed to get on with God and said, now, you're not respected persons. You spoke to him and told him what to do. I'm believing you speak to me and tell me what to do. 
That was the part he wouldn't be able to respect a person's on. We hear what the part we think we could do without doing what you did to get that part. Wait on the Lord. We think because they did it a certain way, we can just copy what they did. I can't copy and build my church or build the church or the church we pastor. Um, some people say, by church, you're being arrogant. No, you understand what I'm saying. I'm not cocky about that. I'm just saying, use that terminology. Because he had a bus ministry to build his church. If I go try to do that, we can lose everything. And go bankrupt trying to do it and keeping those buses supported. Hello? Plus, find enough people with a, with a CDL license or, huh? Is it D or B? D is in dog? B is in boy. C license, okay. Nice. CAL or CBL. You know, so you can call people around. Class B, okay. All right. I got bus drivers, I got truck drivers, I got, all right. I'm none of them. <laughs> Biggest thing I've ever done is towed mobile homes down the road. Yeah. Getting a mobile home toter, pull the things down the road. Yeah, because people look, people drive by you and look at it and pull right up there into the side of the whole thing almost. Look where you're going because you're going to go where you look. So the rabbi looking at it. Hallelujah. Try to do what now? It's one of them alien things. So, so let's get back here. If God's going to give you a dream and you need to be, stay on course, you got to get back to course question and just start. We, we want to do a seminar to tell us how to do what takes the time that we don't want to do. Let's really get down to the root of this. We don't want to go spend time with the Lord to get the answer. We want someone else to do it for us and just put, give us a book to tell us how to do it. Can somebody say, ouch? Hello? Ouch, ouch. We want it done for us and not us do it. There's the microwave. Instant gratification society. We want to give one offering to get debt cancellation instead of tithing and giving over time as a lifestyle. We want to grow the grocery store and pick up our vegetables instead of going out in the backyard and planting seed and fertilizing it and watching it grow and waiting for it to harvest and then picking it and then having to do all the stuff you have to do when it, you know, it comes out of the ground. Like clean it. Get the bugs off of it. Put seven dust out there on your vegetables. Then you got to wash them real good to get that off because you don't want to eat that. Hello? Yet God says there's a vision in your heart. There's a dream. I'm, I'm going to get more into this next week. <coughs> um, we'll move forward from this point. There's a vision in your heart. And the correction, of course, you need will come from waiting on the Lord. And as you wait on him, he says, though it seems like it's been reluctant, though it looks like it's been delayed, wait. Because it will not be in vain. God's telling you that you're waiting and living by faith and pursuing him and staying after him will not be in vain when it comes to the fulfillment of the desire placed in your heart to see it come to pass. Can we say glory? Can you look at someone and say hallelujah? Point at somebody and say, your dream's coming to pass. Now go wait for God. In Jesus' name. Amen? All right, praise. Let's receive the offering. The offering envelope, raise your hand. Give it by Square or Square Cash. Uh, let us uh, you know, go ahead and ring it up with Square or Cash or PayPal. And uh, let's get those electronic ones in. Get your cash ones in. Write your checks. Hallelujah. If you need an envelope, Brother Benny's out there waiting on you. Aren't you, Brother Benny? The envelopes. He's waving them out there. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. Amen. Hallelujah. I guess we're still up and running, huh?
Praise the Lord. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time and the offer of in the storehouse. Thank you the people are blessed who walk in the full supply and overflow because we're faithful to tithe, faithful to give, faithful to walk in obedience to your laws of prosperity in Jesus' name. Anybody agree with that by saying amen? Amen. God bless you as you give. Don't forget Wednesday night. Listen, we got a little bit of breaking down. It's just the chairs today. A little bit of this amiibo. Won't take a whole lot of time. So let's just get after and take her down. Hallelujah. And uh, get it done. Amen? Hallelujah. All righty. We love you. Bless you. You're dismissed. Let's knock it out of the park. In Jesus.